20th of March, so let's get the morning briefing underway and take a, a stock take of the weekend's news and then what we're looking out for uh, for the week ahead. First of all, it's been pretty quiet actually with actual news flow. Not a great deal of major headlines to bring you from the weekend. There's a couple of flashes I can see on Twitter this morning, some still getting retweeted from the ECB comments. Uh, from the weekend, Visco saying the ECB could shorten the break between QE exit and rate hike. Uh, so there's still seemingly a couple of bullish or more hawkish noises coming out of a couple of ECB members, but nothing really too great to move the currency. More so, a bit of dollar weakness again, uh, continuation really of what we saw last week in what otherwise has been, as I say, a quiet weekend of news and really quiet Asian session given the fact that Japanese markets were closed for a market holiday. And the one thing you can probably see though is the pound has had a, I mean like I said both pairs are up about 20 pips each respectively on the dollar weakness but cable seeing a bit of an uptick on that regular kind of 6am time frame as soon as UK and European participants come into market we tend to see a bit of an elevated move that as well breaking above uh, the high that was seen really Friday evening it was around 124.35 so we've had a bit of a test on R1 already this morning which has had a brief kind of fail on the breakout there and it's just acted as a bit of upside resistance thus far but there are a couple of headlines um, with the pound uh, but first of all just taking a look, quick look at the pound here over the last week and really it's seen a, a pretty decent move off those lows that we had Really, 14th marked at the low point of that recent trend lower that we had. Um, more so as well, last week was a bit of a dollar play. Obviously, the Fed being more dovish with the hike in terms of their communication of their rate path thereafter. And as such, the dollar uh, has weakened in the second half of last week. And as I said, that's really continued this morning with the Dixie sitting back below 100. And so that's really helped elevate uh, the sterling currency uh, of late. Now there are a couple of headlines to be aware of, a few people obviously looking at just given the context of, of the pair being higher uh, and one of which is your likes of the Sun, the Express, they're all obviously the kind of more right-leaning papers and so they're talking about Theresa May this morning and from the weekend being urged to call a snap general election seems to be some of the uh, the murmuring ongoing in the political scene domestically here where May's closest allies have discussed holding a snap general election to take seats from the SNP and also head off a constitutional crisis so obviously Nicola Sturgeon causing some upset potentially to the timeline uh, for the government in their pursuit of triggering article 50 as intended by the end of the month obviously between the 27th and the 30th of March we're looking at as the most um, kind of opportune period in order to avert a couple of European events that are ongoing but the Conservative Party chairman and chief whip uh, and the private or the Prime Minister's private secretary have talked about a May 4th ballot in the wake of Sturgeon's demand for a second referendum of Scottish independence and although Miss May has so far or Mrs May so far resisted the idea of shoring up her mandate and increasing her narrow commons majority, the Tory election fraud probe could convince her to call an early poll. Um, the thinking just being then that basically they can kill two birds with one stone by just getting a more bigger outright majority if they were to have a snap election. So quite interesting that given that it's something that I've got on the call board, I am looking for a UK election this year. Uh, but it seems to have come around pretty quickly, the press touting potential May 4th as, the, as a date in mind in order for the Tories then to encapsulate on very much the weak opposition and then to have that larger majority and then to brush aside the election fraud probe ongoing for the Tory party and also Nicola Sturgeon and this second or his call for a second referendum if they can hold a bigger majority in Parliament. So something to just keep an eye on going forward. 
and certainly the pound this morning is up well let's have a look where we are in terms of the the larger picture if we just make this a bit longer dated we're kind of back up towards that cluster of price activity is where we were sitting around 125 pretty much for the best part of February really before we broke that the beginning of March as when we saw a, a bit of a bigger run to the downside where we got sub 122 for a short period but as you can see that dollar weakness from last week really has boosted the pair back on the upside uh, that as well when you start looking at the euro dollar let me just switch over my charts so I was just looking there longer term with cable but likewise with the ECB let's just take a look as well on a longer time frame while my charts just load up you've had a little bit of uh, as well at least tensions you would say over the French situation seem to have quietened down somewhat but that is due to change shortly you do have I believe a first televised debate ongoing uh, and it's going to start this evening and no doubt these do have quite a strong influence on voting intentions particularly when people are a little bit sat on the fence um, with the context of people who might typically not have wanted to back Macron but maybe are left with no other viable alternative and so it'd be interesting to see given his kind of shorter I guess political experience how he can stand up against more experienced campaigners like Filon and then obviously the more popular at this point Le Pen uh, that definitely could shape some of the opinion polls going forward or for the euro currency uh, but likewise with sterling you can see or the cable pair we've had a pretty good recovery uh, also as well with the the ECB most recent press conference as well that we've had and so we're back up towards the the upper end of the more recent range that we've had really for 2017 uh, we'd have to be getting up to the 109 mark where we got just short of uh, really when we were looking kind of Feb the beginning of Feb pretty much uh, so only around a point away from there at the moment and and certainly with the week ahead uh, it probably could not couldn't be ruled out as a as a a look at around those upper levels if the the news plays out in the right way but looking at Macron let's have a quick look at that as well so this is the situation here it's kind of the unexpected person really on the, the back of the demise of Filon with the allegations that have been ongoing and so now he is as this headline suggests he's really the target man because he's almost got it all to lose whereas with Le Pen her following has been fairly consistent throughout whereas Macron essentially has surged more recently uh, you can see that in the chart here this is even just going back to late February you can see Macron was tracking at really sub 20 whereas now he's pretty much matching like for like in most recent ones with Le Pen uh, on the balance of polls of polls whereas Le Pen pretty steady Filon has been on a gradual kind of decline if you like and the other more socialist members very much just out of the running so to speak really it's only the major three the big three that people are talking about at this point in time but televised debates ongoing uh, as of tonight you can see here first televised debate featuring all five of the leading candidates but as I was saying, Macron standing in the polls, his relative lack of experience and his centrist positions mean he offers the richest seam of pickings for his rivals. Again, if you think about it, if you're very left-leaning, you've obviously got very strong view on certain policies. Likewise, if you're Le Pen, obviously the obvious thing would be immigration, Eurosceptic, calling EU referendums, all very strong emotion, emotive arguments. Whereas if you're a centrist politician, you've kind of you're sitting on the on the balance and, and it's you're pretty easy pickings if you're um, on those far extremes which is he's going to come under some pressure on at the moment feel on likewise a little bit more centrist but obviously a much more old school campaigner uh, and probably more likely to be better equipped 
to be under pressure in these types of political situations in Macron. So I really think this time tomorrow could be quite telling for the French election situation and how well he stands up to that first real test in the public eye. Uh, could be very interesting. Moving on, the other thing I want to talk about is oil because that's become, again, very interesting after it was fairly dull for a, uh, an extended period of time. I think that was really when we went through this, this period of consolidation, looking slightly more longer dated here on a daily continuation chart. And really it was when we were between this 50 to $55 handle is when OPEC had kind of found their sweet spot, if you like, of keeping prices uh, not too high that the U.S. can be outright rampant in their U.S. output, although that has somewhat been the case, um, but keeping it at a price point where it's more healthy, let's say, from a, a fiscal or balancing their books point of view. But what we've had more recently is a break below 50, which has also acted as quite psychologically, and we saw a run lower down to test 47 before stabilizing more recently. But the last week, obviously, trading sub-50 has seen some quite interesting developments change in market positioning. So why is this fall happening? We've talked about it before, and really it's this U.S. drilling, boosting rigs, countering the OPEC curves, as you can see from this headline by Bloomberg. This really is one of the key things at the moment. Now, what you had every Friday is you have the latest in the... Every Friday you have the latest rig count data. And what you had here for US fills last week was extending drilling surge into a tenth month, according to Baker Hughes. Baker Hughes is that company that released their figures every Friday evening at around 6 p.m. So this, of course, is against what Saudis are trying to achieve, which is they've now become, again, fairly vocal that they're ready to extend cuts if supplies stay above their five-year average. This was according to the energy minister, Al Fali of Saudi Arabia, in an interview with Bloomberg TV. So what you're looking at here then is the rig count coming up, the OPEC cut that obviously came into action. But what's happening now is that they're probably going to have to get more aggressive cut again in order to make sure that the price remains off its lowest point. Because at this point, the US have been pretty clear on what their intentions are, and that is to really give the Middle Eastern names a run for their money. And these OPEC counts, if anything, are getting even more aggressive. I think if we scroll down in this article, they have the actual number of increase. And this was it. US drillers boosted their rig count by 14 to 631 last week. Now, 14 might not sound like a lot, but that's pretty much double, I'd say, what the average usually is on the increases that we've seen over the last couple of months. And the nation's crude output, as we saw with the weekly oil inventories last week, has climbed to 9.1 million barrels per day now, which is the most since February of last year. And so these numbers definitely to keep an eye on. What has this led to? Well, if you look at bullish crude bets, they've basically been cut the most on record as we've got back below 50. So the market managers, so money managers, WCI net long positions have now slipped to a three month low. And basically people now are flipping their kind of expectation in the futures markets. So every week we kind of get a measurement of the speculative positions to the present, i.e. how much the market is net long or short. And then generally what we're seeing then is that the market is changing their, their view fewer people in the market holding net long positions as they lose kind of uh, I guess or OPEC loses its credibility that they're they're gonna have to cut the market's gonna force their hand if this price keeps on going lower and so it's just quite interesting to see here as you can see in the chart manage money net length tumbles as $50 are broken and then if we scroll down uh, a bit more, you can see here as well the infantry situation where we're getting still kind of these blips of large infantry builds, although that's been countered somewhat by marginal kind of two, three hundred thousand drawdowns overall. You know, having had recent weeks of nine, 10, 14 million builds, uh, stockpiles are still at very elevated levels. 
with US output only increasing at a fairly aggressive rate with rig counts, as we said, going up quite drastically at the moment and is forcing price lower. And so WTI crude has been just drifting down, um, kind of making this situation all the much more worse. So the balance has changed now, I guess, with crude oil, and especially as we sit around or below 50, you know, for the strats that we were writing through much of the beginning of 2017, it was always we felt more comfortable with uh, the long within the range, so to speak. But now we're below these levels. It definitely changes the, the picture a little bit fundamentally, particularly around these, um, these topics just discussed. And so I guess upside now that 50 will become fairly important if we get back up towards testing that level. Uh, keeping in mind that we're around well, just short of two bucks away from there. I guess if the calendar's fairly quiet, really, um, it's going to be the infantry data, which will be key. And obviously, you've got the three measures to look out for. Genscape on Monday. Um, you have the APIs on Tuesday evening and then Wednesday for the Department of Energy's readings, which could be key to see the next kind of move in direction from here. Uh, but 50 will be a key level on the upside resistance, both psychologically as well as uh, technically. Okay, other things in the weekend, just so you're aware in the news flow side of things. Donald Trump just being Donald Trump, so I guess you could call it unsurprising in a way. Uh, but Germany trades barbs with Trump on defence after Merkel meeting. Obviously Trump and Merkel uh, had a meeting at the end of last week. Uh, but Trump then tweeted on Saturday that Germany owes a vast sums of money to NATO and the US must be paid more for the powerful and very expensive defense it provides to Germany. So a little bit outspoken here from Trump, but actually I guess he does have a little bit of um, credence behind what he, what he is saying because countries like Germany are in effect underpaying. Uh, if I do, do scroll down here in the article it did paint a bit of clarity but it essentially goes towards the contributions of what each NATO member should be putting forward as part of their GDP and essentially um, well you got it here Germany's spending about 1.2 percent on defense at the moment now as part of NATO nations basically the alliance's goal is that members spend two percent of their GDP on defense and Germany are not doing that uh, Obama had been pretty vocal as well about this back in 2016. He had said something s similar about free riders aggravate me. Uh, so Trump obviously just doing it through non-traditional channels, i.e. his Twitter account being quite outspoken uh, against who is a very, very influential member on the global political scene is what makes it probably more interesting having had conversations with Merkel but not really seeing much of a, a market impact to that at the moment. Elsewhere data wise this morning really this is a, a familiar theme which is why you're not really seeing any outright reaction to it in the market. German inflation has become fairly well known so to speak for at least for the time being. And you've got German producer price inflation surging to a five-year high of 3.1%. So Germany's producer price inflation following the path of CPI in Europe's largest economy and now at a five-year high. So you can see how we've we had this period. This is why, if anything, the ECB is starting to get a little bit more vocal about almost planting the seed in investors' heads about the potential of the deposit rate could come up pre the end of the quantitative easing program some concerns about European inflation starting to rear its head this is because it's the first time really in a long time a period of probably three years plus and certainly since the inception of QE where we've actually start to see now a bit of follow-through into actual economic data and inflation readings is starting to show that effect to some degree um, so these readings Again, I think the market's kind of used to this, especially from a German perspective, but certainly need to be monitored going forward. And what probably most important will be um, looking at what ECB speakers have to say about that happening. Okay, quickly then looking at the calendar for today. Uh, and as per usual, Mondays, you, you've probably got the point now in terms of how the kind of 
landscape of a general trading week. It tends to be fairly quiet and economic data on a Monday and today is no different. Uh, really, there's nothing major coming out in scheduled economic data. You do have an interesting speaker though. You've got Feds Evans, a voter and Dove is speaking at four o'clock this afternoon. Um, but I would say that now with the Fed having telegraphed uh, their kind of more dovish stance, or at least against how the market was priced last week, not really expecting a great deal. It'd be interesting to see like how dovish would they be, given that Evans tends to lean on that side. So we'll be speaking later today. And in fact, if we look at the week as a whole, I did send this out to, to you guys this morning so you can help plan ahead. Remember what I said to you guys this time last week about what you should do on a Monday, especially when the markets are very quiet, is take a look through the entire week here. Almost what I've put together here is not everything. These are just the main things that are coming out. And of this, you can probably only circle about two or three things which would be seen as the main market events for the week. And so once you know where those potential opportunities might come, it will give you a better idea of how to probably allocate your week as a whole. You know, what you don't want to be doing is on a very quiet morning, there's no major economic data coming out such as today. Um, there's no major speakers really until later, until Evans. So the worst thing you, want, you could do is get caught up in trying to force a trade idea in a market that's not really moving too much, especially when there might be a greater degree of movement um, later on. Also as well, say if you were trading cable this morning, and let's say it remains pretty quiet and you see a potential for a breakout, you know, you've got to ask yourself the question as well, is that even if it did, how far would the market move when you've got things like UK CPI in the market as well as the Monetary Policy Committee are very concerned about monitoring that of inflation. And as such then, you know, knowing these things ahead of time might give you a better reference point then as to the impact that certain um, price movements can have. So looking at the week then, moving on from Monday, obviously those UK inflation data will be important for FX traders certainly uh, in the currency market for cable. Um, speakers though from the Fed are fairly prevalent. Yeah, George, Mester, Rosengren, Evans all kicking off the first half of the week and then you've got Yellen, then you've got Mr. Dove himself, Kashkari, who is that dot plot, if you remember, tracking much lower than all the rest in that summary of economic projections uh, last week. So Yellen and Kashkari, that'll be Thursday. Then you've got Evans, Bullard and Williams. So there's a, there's a lot of Fed speak forthcoming. Otherwise, looking at Wednesday, uh, you've got the BOJ minutes overnight. Fairly quiet though in terms of data. Then into Thursday, uh, for FX traders, for the Kiwi dollar, you've got the interest rate decision and statement. Uh, you've got UK retail sales. That's been quite an interesting one as well of late, given it started to show some signs of deterioration over the last couple of months uh, as people start to tighten their belts amid rising inflation. Uh, you also get the weekly jobs claims, new home sales, but really the speakers take precedence. And at the end of the week, you get the manufacturing service PMIs pretty much globally, uh, likewise from the US, and then you've got mortgage approvals in the UK. So overall, not too much, I'd say, in the way of major economic data. Not like you had the big event kind of midweek last week with the Fed and with the Dutch elections and so on. But other things to probably layer into this, uh, in particular, you've got that French televised debate going on this evening. Uh, and that could define then some of the price movement going in for euro currency when we come in tomorrow morning. And then you've got layered in with that the UK inflation figures. So uh, maybe Tuesday morning could be quite interesting uh, as, a, as a week as a whole. Okay, coming up to nine o'clock, going to leave it at that. Uh, as I say, pretty quiet over the weekend in terms of news. Uh, and this morning, not a great deal going on. Uh, so maybe just time for a bit of a stock take and planning for the week ahead as a whole, uh, but also just keeping an eye on oil prices amid those points we just discussed. Okay guys, enjoy the session and I'll see you in the chat room, thank you.